Welcome, fellow sciencers. It is I, Aaron Freeman, Chicago Brain Buddy. And we have a new Chicago Brain Buddy. We met right here at the Society for Neuroscience annual meeting here in beautiful San Diego, Dr. Bob Schaefer. <laughs> Who is a, a shill for lumosity, but not but <laughs> but not merely a shill for the lumosity because you are an actual scientist. And we, but first of all, let us thank you so much for taking some time. When I saw you the other day down at the poster board, I said, Whoo, lumosity, my spidey senses are tingling. So quickly let's go through why my spidey senses tingled. Yeah. Yeah, so the spidey sense, I think a lot has happened over the last fifteen years or so. So and within the last 10 or 15 years, computerized cognitive training had its birth and then this kind of skyrocketing in public perception that led to a lot of backlash and a lot of concerns about the types of claims that were being made. So is cognitive training going to go make you Einstein overnight? Is it going to make you better at every single thing you do in your, better at sports, better at everything Will else? Will it cure your Alzheimer's? Right. So, so the, the idea of the claims being overblown, I think that makes a lot of people really hesitant to dig into the science behind it and actually get to the, to the questions that matter. I think it's fair to point out that yeah. that was the marketing department. Well, right. <laughs> There's so, a difference so. between the marketing department and guys like you. And so I think the, the key thing is that all of this conversation around marketing claims being exaggerated or overblown, I think that's a really important conversation, but the science itself, the question about whether cognitive training can improve performance on cognitive assessments or performance measured in other ways, that was not you know, part of the, the big dispute and, and conversation around, uh, around Lumosity and other brain training companies. So brain training and games particularly yeah. came to the fore of a lot of people like me back in the, I think, 90s with the very famous Minnesota nuns study and crossword puzzles. Right. Right, so the idea that, well, so inspired by the concept of experience-dependent plasticity, so experience-dependent neuroplasticity, the idea that depending on the way that you use your brain, you can actually change the structure and function of your brain. And so the idea of doing brain training in general actually goes back hundreds or thousands of years, always looking for different tasks that you can do to challenge different cognitive domains and hopefully improve those different cognitive skills or cognitive abilities. So yeah, there's nothing new about the idea of doing things that actually help make you sharper. The idea of bringing that to millions and millions of people through technology, so computerized cognitive training, really the hope, the vision there is that if we can provide tools to people around the world, this might be a really nice way of impacting the way that people's minds work. Now this business of finding of, of millions of people around yeah. the world is a really big deal because you, you guys have now been able to, because you're online, because you had people of all ages all over the world take these, these uh, Lumosity courses and play the games. Mm -hmm. So what, you, you, what have you found? What, first of yeah. all, tell me about, a little about the methodology that's used in analyzing the Lumosity games. Sure, absolutely. And so the brief background about what Lumosity is. Okay. So Lumosity... Well, everybody knows Lumosity! <laughs> so that's the thing, actually. <laughs> everybody has this idea about what Lumosity is, but often there are some details that are not quite right. So Lumosity is a brain training program, so it's available on, on the web and also through mobile apps. It's a library of dozens of cognitive tasks that are gamified. So we've got these brain games. Each one is inspired by or adapted from a task in the lab or the clinic. And so each one is, is designed to target a specific cognitive area. So things like memory or attention, information processing speed, things like that. And, and these are standard kind of uh, cognitive tests that are given to people who, who don't play games. Yeah, so, so they come from kind of a wide literature. Some of them are cognitive assessments originally. Some of them are training tasks originally. So really the, the inspiration is broad there. Um, and then through the training, the idea is that uh, we recommend you know three to five times a week you do these workouts. So we make recommendations of different games that you'll play. And so you can come in and play several games a day. Uh, there's, a, there's a free version of Lumosity, so anyone can go to Lumosity and play brain games every single day. And then there is a paid version of it that provides more guidance, personalization, feedback, kind of analysis of your performance, things like that. So that's what Lumosity is. 
it's now the, the methodology here. So the big question around cognitive training is transfer of learning. So the idea that as I train on these games, I might get better at the games, is that making me better in other ways as right. well, right? And so first of all, one thing that gets me very excited about the idea of bringing these games to lots and lots of people is even before the transfer of learning, just the idea that we can actually understand how people learn cognitive skills. So if you can look, ha look at how 100 million people are learning new cognitive skills, you can start to understand individual differences in learning, you can start to understand that actually for certain cognitive tasks, including some that are commonly used in the lab or the clinic, there might be different strategies that people are using. It might not be a perfectly clean read on one particular cognitive right. domain. You can get so much information about cognitive learning. So beyond that, now when we go to the transfer of learning piece. So first of all, what about from one game to another game? So as I train on one game, I might get better at a, a different game. So I might train on, you know, we have a game called Pinball Recall. So you, it's got spatial working memory, we've got different bumpers on a grid, and then you put a ball into it, and you've got to remember where the bumpers were and how they were oriented to make the ball go through there. Turns out that as people train on Pinball Recall, they also get better at games that also have some aspect of spatial recall. So another one called Memory Matrix. And we can see this, we can see this because now there are billions of games played, billions of cognitive games played by millions and millions of people. You can start to have that ability to dive into the data and actually characterize transfer of learning from one cognitive task to another, which is fascinating. And one, it goes even farther, but yeah. Well, I was gonna say one of the things that the online uh, um, the, the wide and large number of people playing yeah. allows you to break down the data by, by well, by age. <laughs> well. So tell us about, so <laughs> tell us, there's differences, okay, so cognitive abilities tend to decline when you hit around, your cutoff is 50, I think, what you guys said? Uh, so for one particular analysis, we right. were looking at kind of older adults and younger adults, and we used 50 as a cutoff. There's no magical number cutoff there. I think what we're I mean, laughing 80, about 90 is... 80-90 really is a better one, but I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> right? So, so the, the unfortunate thing, not just from what we see, but the literature on age-related cognitive decline, for many, for many of these cognitive assessments, peak performance is in your 20s, and then it's kind of downhill from there. And that doesn't mean... <laughs> that, that Don't doesn't, kill yourself. Yeah, yeah, you know, Don't we, worry we, about we can, it. It's going to be okay. <laughs> we can justify that however we want. But, but so the idea here is that we know that, uh, that this relationship between age and cognitive performance is something that's really meaningful and, and important, relevant to a lot of people. So some work that we, uh, that we presented here at the conference uh, and are, are in the process of writing up, so we'll treat it still as preliminary until it's uh, entirely published and out there. Um, so this was using data from a big randomized controlled trial where we had looked at the impact of Lumosity training versus an active control group. And we used crossword puzzles. So we were looking at the impact of Lumosity training, the impact of crossword puzzles, as it relates to performance on a separate battery of cognitive assessments. So, so really you're doing training over here and we wanna know if you take an assessment before and after your training, is there a difference in performance? And does that difference depend on what type of training you were doing? And so we actually looked at not only the type of training you were doing, but are we seeing the same type of improvement for older adults and younger adults? And the short story here, and now this is a, a positive side. Oh, so good. Oh, good. Are, yeah. one. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. The positive <laughs> side was that we actually found that these training effects, so these improvements in performance, these were homogeneous across age. So these were there for both older and younger adults and roughly the, yeah. So, so this was a, a nice promising story because it could have been the case that actually the process of learning is different and you know diminishes. And I think that there's still a lot that, that we can be doing to really understand, really understand your capacity for learning as you age. And so this was just you know, an initial look at this, but we saw roughly the same size improvement for people of all ages when they were doing the training. But older people didn't suddenly have the cognitive right. abilities of a 23-year-old. Right. The 60-year-olds were, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> but, but, but there was improvement in both younger people 
and older people after playing the games. That's right. And, and importantly, though, when we're talking about improvement here, this is improvement measured in just a few different ways. So improvement measured as performance on a battery of cognitive assessments, also improvement in some self-reported measures of cognition. So we know that especially uh, for older adults who have age-related cognitive decline, if there's a lot of anxiety around things like memory or just mental abilities in general, that the self-reported kind of subjective nature of the outcomes is... Am I forgetting my keys less often? Exactly. Am I remembering my parking space? Do I still remember my name without checking my underwear? Exactly, exactly. And so we looked at those, those outcome measures, so the objective performance on the assessments, also some subjective measures, but really what we would love to do is start to answer the question, how does that relate to various clinical conditions? How does that relate to my ability to live independently, my quality of life? all these other questions and so such a rich area of research we're doing some ourselves but actually we we try to promote research uh, by other groups by providing free access to lumosity brain training also to the assessments the neurocognitive performance test and also to de-identified data and so we have something called the human cognition project or HCP and basically anyone out there any researcher can apply to the HCP and if their application is accepted, we give them free access to all these tools because we know that we are not the experts in every single area. So if there's a group that's really an expert in a particular area, let's say mild cognitive impairment or you know dementia, Alzheimer's, something like that, they can apply to use Lumosity tools and focus on that particular area of interest. And we're more than happy to give the tools so that we can you know, have a very vibrant research community and hopefully get some answers. Well, speaking of which, I believe your data is available. So, so yes, so the data... Just we, in case we still don't... Tr you're a lovely guy, but we might not trust you. Yeah, <laughs> Don't worry, I know, pro worry, I. So this is, this is uh, the data for this big randomized controlled trial. That was made available when the publication initially came out in 2015. So you can go and get that data set and play around with it as much as you want. And we're so trying. it's yours. You can do it. <laughs> and then through the HCP, we actually provide very large data sets. So a lot of de-identified data on various aspects of training or assessment, uh, depending on the specific proposal from the, from the researcher. And we're working on making more just publicly available, getting it up there. Of course, we want to be thinking very thoroughly about you know the type of data that we're putting up there. Everything is de-identified, but it's also just a ton of data to go through and to, to host. <laughs> so uh, Lumos Labs? Lumos Labs. Lumos is, Labs. Mm -hmm. Subsequent to the, the, the kerfuffle, yep. is there a tighter coordination between the researchers and the marketing de the marketers now? Yeah, so, so I'll say yes in general, and then also I think I think from the get-go, research has been a fundamental, you know, a cornerstone of both the product development and then that validation procedures. And I'd say that now, yes, we're we're really trying to figure out what is the right language to talk about <laughs> once cognitive burned. training. Right. Yeah, and we we just want to be able to do it in a very precise way. We want to be we want to show people how excited we actually are but also make sure that what we're saying is kind of the accurate, appropriate representation of what we're doing. So I'd say right now we are firmly committed to you know, helping people improve and feel confident in their mental abilities, and we're providing these tools. We want to get them out to the world. We also want to describe exactly what we're showing. We're not saying that when you train on this, you become Einstein tomorrow. It's actually hard work. You've got to stay with it. Some of the work that we presented here showed how long you have to be training to see improvements of various sizes. Like it, it was a fairly impressive number, number of hours that you had yeah. to, to get real effects. What was it? So like? a, a rule of thumb, I, so this is a, 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 the relationship continues on for quite a while, but after about 20 hours, you've reached you know, a, a fair amount of that improvement. But so 20 hours cumulative, if you think about this as, think about it as going to the gym. You're not gonna go to the gym once work out for half an hour and expect to suddenly be buff and, and you know fit. You want to actually have this be a healthy habit that you stick with over the course of weeks and months. And so just to clear this up again, how confident are we that this is generalizable that by just if by doing well in these games, doing our twenty hours of gameplay at what in, in chunks of two minutes, three minutes at a time. Right. How confident are we that this will generally in some measurable way improve my cognitive, that's all I care about, yeah. my cognitive yep. performance. Okay, so let's start with the most basic, 
potentially boring. We are absolutely confident that as you train, if you do targeted training, you will improve at the skills that you're training. Okay. And, you know, that's the, the performance no-brainer. on these games. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'll say it's not quite a no-brainer. It is possible to not really pay attention as you're doing this. We enough. can see that there are some people who do not improve as they play the games. And so, yeah, you've got to put in the work. Right. So getting better at the skills that you're training on. Next question is, will training on one type of cognitive task actually make me better at a different type of cognitive task? So the transfer of learning between games. Right. And, you know, driven by, this is a big data question right here. So if we look at the 5 billion game plays by 100 million people, this is, this is crystal clear in the data that as you train on some games, it actually impacts your performance on other games as well. So that's one okay. step more. We're still kind of in the near transfer of learning. So now we look at one step farther. So if I train on Lumosity games, will it make me better at another measure of cognitive performance? So that's where we use a separate battery of cognitive assessments. And these are kind of standard assessments that you would see in a neuropsychologist's office, but just digitized, computerized versions. And very clear results there that on this battery of assessment, you know, randomized controlled trial, thousands of people involved, and we definitely saw improvements on this battery of assessments. But I think Again, you know, that only goes so far. That's measuring it through assessments. That's measuring also the self-reported measures. Right. We really want to know how that impacts quality of life. We really want to know how that impacts your ability to do your job and your ability to actually live a happy life. And that's the area that we really, that, that we see as the big opportunity for future research. And again, some of that's us, but we really think that we can be making just as big of an impact or a bigger impact by giving our tools to other people who can do that research. So absolutely, we can see transfer of learning between tasks and to a battery of cognitive assessments. The real fun question is beyond that, and that's, that's what we need to do now. <laughs> More work to be done. I, well, as I so. said, you know, after talking to you, my spidey senses calmed <laughs> I'm down. I'm happy to hear that. I, it did. My spidey <laughs> senses calmed down. You're finding man. And so and anyone who wants to try Lumosity can do so for free. Yes. Uh, and see if that's what your self-report is. Exactly. You can and use Lumosity every day for the rest of your life for free and just Lumosity.com. Be a part of the apps. research. That's L- right. Lumosity.com. It'll be on the little Chiron. Great. Bob, Dr. Bob Schaefer, thank you so thank much. You. Appreciate it, brother. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, beloved sibling, for watching again. We will see you next time on the Chicago Brain Buddies. That was hey. simple, painless. It's fun. Thanks. Oh, perfect. You did a great job. All the shots were good. We got the recording. That worked out all right.